thank you very much, uh, Robert and uh, Joel, for giving me the opportunity to uh, be part of this uh, nice conference. So, uh, as uh, Robert already introduced, my topic are multidimensional continued fractions, and I will use them to produce uh, symbolic codings of low complexity of uh, toral translations of uh, higher dimensional toras. Tor tori, uh, special emphasis uh, will be put on tori of uh, dimension two and three. So let me start with a moment. Let me start with some well-known uh, objects. Uh, first, uh, the classical continued fractions the continued fraction of the expansion of X. Uh, I just uh, introduced the notation here. The convergence will be uh, denoted by Pn over Qn, and there are these uh, well-known recurrence relations that uh, allow to uh, calculate these quantities. Another thing uh, that I will need uh, Later, I will leave really exact definitions later. Uh, Sturmian sequences. So, um, sloppily speaking, how, how do, we, do we define them? We just take slope in the plane, uh, and then uh, we code this plane. We just start at the origin, then go in some direction. Let's go up, and then we always move uh, towards the line we are approximating. This gives us a stepped surface, uh, a stepped line, uh, and uh, each time uh, we uh, go vertically, we write out two. Each time we go horizontally, we write out one. This uh, provides us uh, a coding of this line uh, by an infinite word of uh, two letters. Uh, in this case, uh, I showed you uh, the slope uh, one over square root of two, and it will become important uh, that uh, so the, the, the continued fraction expansion of this will uh, become important. So uh, uh, a continued fraction uh, algorithm, uh, this is a machine that uh, writes out matrices, that produces sequences of matrices. Each step uh, you perform in the algorithm, uh, you uh, create a matrix. And uh, for instance, if you look at the additive continued fraction algorithm, uh, the matrices you write out are these matrices M1, and then two, uh, the uh, classical continuous fraction algorithm is an acceleration of this uh, algorithm. So what I want to do is I want to, to put something uh, on top of this algorithm. I want to superimpose something on this algorithm. The algorithm just creates the matrices. I want uh, to uh, define substitutions. And these substitutions uh, are related with uh, the matrices in the following way. So if you look at the image of one, there is once one occurrence of one and no occurrence of two. So the first column, one occurrence of one, no occurrence of two. The same for two. There is one occurrence of one and one occurrence of two here. So I write one occurrence of one and one occurrence of two here. So uh, I just defined this uh, substitution. Uh, of course, there is some freedom. I could switch those two letters. But what is important for me is that this substitution is defined in a way that it's this is called the abelianization of the incidence matrix of the substitution. The substitution is defined in a way that the incidence matrix coincides with the matrix that is produced by the continued fraction algorithm. So there are two matrices, and therefore I want to define uh, two substitutions. So uh, now, uh, if I run my continued fraction algorithm, uh, if it produces matrices, uh, it also produces these substitutions I associated with the matrices. Uh, so uh, if you look at the acceleration, uh, uh, then uh, you, you, you look at matrices of uh, the uh, shape M1 to some power of A, uh, respectively uh, M2 uh, uh, taken to some power of A. And uh, so powers of matrices, they correspond to powers of substitution. So also these powers of the substitutions fit together with uh, the powers of the matrices. So M1 to the power of A, would be related to the substitution sigma 1 to the power of a. Uh, on the letter 1, this gives just 1. On the letter 2, this gives 2. And then a bunch of 1s, a times 1s. And the same for sigma 2. So uh, all I did is uh, associated substitutions with the matrices created by the continued fraction algorithm. Uh, and so uh, 
I want to, to show you again this example. This is again one of us squared of two. On the right hand side, uh, you can see the, the partial quotients. And now we apply the continued fraction algorithm step by step. And uh, so if you look at the ordinary continued fraction algorithm, uh, so uh, if you use slope, and after some steps to your slope, uh, we associate to our slope, we associate two integers. So the vertical distance here and uh, the, uh, the, the horizontal distance here and the vertical distance here. So this is just, uh, if you take uh, the vector 0, 1 and multiply it by a certain matrix associated with the algorithm, then you get exactly this point here, which gives you an approximation of the slope. And now I told you I don't want to use uh, the matrices. Instead of um, producing the sequence of matrices, multiplying matrices, I uh, want to compose substitutions. And when I compose substitutions, uh, I don't get uh, vectors with integer entries anymore. I get sequences of letters. And uh, if I interpret these sequences of letters as before, two goes up and one goes uh, right, then you see you get a stepped line which approximates the slope very nicely and ends exactly uh, where uh, the matrix, uh, the matrix uh, maps, in this case, the, the, the horizontal piece here. So uh, this gives me more than the uh, continuous fraction algorithm. Uh, not only did I reach uh, a point that approximates my slope very well, I also uh, get a nice way to this point, if you want to put it like that. Okay. So uh, these sequences, uh, as I told you, they are created by uh, composing substitutions. And uh, so if you do this ad infinitum, then you get an infinite, an infinite sequence. And uh, this uh, infinite sequence is called an aesthetic sequence. This is a sequence that is created uh, by a sequence of substitutions. And the sequence of substitutions here is then called the directive sequence of the uh, word that you will uh, produce. So uh, let me say something more before I come to uh, definitions, to, to more uh, exact definitions. So you have your slope and you have your uh, broken line that approximates uh, this slope. And what you do now, uh, you uh, project this broken line, as it is indicated here, you project this broken line uh, to some interval here. And if this broken line is at bounded distance from your slope, then uh, you can project on a finite interval. And you can easily see that uh, uh, each uh, step is a translation on this uh, interval. So if you go right, you translate downwards. If you go up, you translate upwards. So if two translations depending on where you go on your uh, uh, stepped line. However, um, you can do something nice here. You can just wrap this interval here around the circle. And if you wrap it around the circle, then uh, you create uh, a rotation, you create uh, in, in this way a, a rotation around the torus. Uh, you can uh, exactly determine how large this torus would be. and. Uh, uh, this uh, rotation is coded by uh, this uh, two-letter word uh, that is defined in step of uh, in in, uh, in in terms of this uh, broken line. Uh, so there's another thing uh, I should uh, tell you probably. So you have now an, a rotation here. If the slope is irrational, this is an irrational rotation. And uh, so if you subdivide. Uh, this interval in two subintervals uh, by subdividing it at the origin, uh, then uh, you get a partition here, and it, uh, it turns out that because this broken line is at bounded distance from the slope here, uh, this uh, partition uh, forms sets which are bounded uh, remainder sets. So all this uh, will be explained in more detail later. So uh, also, uh, if you look at this uh, rotation, so uh, it is possible to recover the continued uh, fraction expansion uh, of the slope alpha. And uh, in order to do this, you have to study uh, induced mappings of this rotation. So you see here the, uh, several different uh, things uh, fit together here. Uh, we have uh, uh, rotations, uh, we have the continued fractions, and uh, we have some combinatorial defined uh, broken lines of low complexity. Now, 
let me uh, give you more exact definitions. So the first definition, uh, I told you already that uh, the sequences uh, of uh, ones and twos we produce here, they have low complexity. So uh, say for periodic sequences, uh, there's a class of sequences with uh, lowest complexity, uh, so called Sturmian sequences. So if you take an alphabet of uh, two letters, uh, then uh, a word, uh, in, uh, one sided infinite word could be two sided, but I am uh, looking at one sided ones here. So, one sided infinite word is called a Sturmian sequence if its complexity function satisfies PU of n is equal to n plus one. This means if you, if you uh, look at the sequence and if you uh, take out uh, of words of length n, then uh, you will only see n plus one different uh, words of length n in this sequence. This is the Sturmian sequences. So, sorry. Uh, then uh, I also used the term natural coding. I want to define the natural coding here in this uh, one dimensional case. Uh, let alpha be some irrational number. Uh, a sequence uh, over the alphabet one, two is a natural coding of the rotation uh, if the following is true. So, with, with respect to a partition, I take a very particular partition. So, I, I take the unit interval modulo one, so I take the, 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 the one torus, I subdivide it in two intervals. I one goes from zero to one minus alpha, and I two goes from one minus alpha to one. And now what I do is, I do the rotation, and whenever I'm in the first interval, I write out one. Whenever I'm in the second interval, I write out two. Uh, this is just formalized here. And uh, this uh, uh, thing that, that uh, comes out here, this is called the, nat the natural coding of uh, this rotation. Uh, this depends, of course, on the starting point, uh, x. Uh, I told you before that uh, the fact that uh, a broken line is close to the slope which it approximates is uh, related to the notion of bounded remainder set. So I just recall you the definition. A bounded remainder set is a measurable set uh, such that there is some constant c uh, that uh, guarantees that uh, the number of times you hit the set uh, minus the number of times you should hit it is bounded by an absolute constant. So the local discrepancy for this set uh, is bounded. This is uh, what the bounded uh, remainder set is. Uh, there is a written old result by Keston, uh, which says uh, in the 1D case that uh, the intervals uh, uh, which are bounded remainder sets are intervals of, uh, of these forms. And uh, the intervals I took before I wanted to, they fall into this class. So now, uh, let me come to uh, a classical result, which forms uh, the basis of the theory uh, we developed in the recent years. So uh, this is due to uh, Morse and Hedlund, 1940, and, and Cohen and Hedlund, uh, some 30 years later. Uh, and uh, this result says that uh, U is a Sturmian sequence if and only if U is a natural coding of an irrational rotation on the torus. Uh, so you have uh, on the one side some combinatorially defined sequence, and on the other side you have uh, some dynamics going on, and uh, uh, these two are linked by this theorem of Morse and Hitlund. And uh, so I am not interested in the original proof by Morse and Hitlund, I'm interested by a very ingenious and clever proof uh, of this result. Uh, that was given by uh, Rosie. Uh, and uh, so uh, Rosie built this bridge between uh, the uh, combinatorics and the dynamics by means of arithmetic. So uh, he uh, used the classical continuous fraction. Oh, so in his proof, in the, the classical continuous fraction algorithm pops up in a natural way. Uh, so uh, I want to. Uh, give you some outline of this proof. So uh, we want to prove that uh, Sturmian words are uh, rotations on the torus. The other, the other direction is not hard. Uh, so how do we prove this? We take a Sturmian word, and uh, you recall that uh, a Sturmian word uh, has factor complexity n plus 1. 
So if n is equal to two, this means there are three subvarieties of length two, and it is uh, easy to see that we either have to have those two, uh, those three subvarieties, or those three subvarieties. In either case, we need one, two, and two, one, because uh, if we cannot switch back and forth, uh, we will end up with an eventually constant word, uh, which is periodic and therefore uh, doesn't fall into the class of student words. So those two cases uh, are uh, possible for a student word. So U is a student word. Uh, uh, now, uh, recall that uh, I defined some substitutions uh, earlier, the substitution sigma 1 and the substitution sigma 2. We already know that these substitutions are somewhat related to the continued fraction algorithm. Now, uh, suppose that, uh, so you, you see that there are two types of these two members. Either 1, 1 occurs and 2, 2 does not, or 2, 2 occurs and 1, 1 does not. So suppose that, that uh, one one occurs or that i i occurs okay then uh so uh there are no so if this is probably not good so suppose ai is one one this is probably easier to explain then two two doesn't occur if two two doesn't occur then uh, your word just consi consists of uh images of this substitution uh concatenated okay so in other words Forget this large sigma here for the moment, or forget it forever. It's, it's probably not, uh, not so interesting for us now. So what you can do, if you have a Sturman word of type i, so to say, so, such that uh, i, i is a factor, then you can write u as sigma i of u prime. So you can sort of desubstitute your Sturman word. And by some uh, balanced properties, uh, this is a bit of a technical thing. You can show that uh, the word here inside the substitution is again a Sturman word. And now, so you see, uh, this is like doing one step of the additive continued fraction algorithm on words. Uh, if you uh, recall that these substitutions here are related to uh, the continued fraction algorithm. And so now, since u prime is again Sturman word, you can iterate this. And uh, again, I ask you to, to forget this uh, uh, capital sigma. They are related to uh, Ostrovsky expansions, but I don't want to go into this now. So U is essentially uh, uh, just uh, 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 block of sigma sigmas uh, applied to UN. So you can uh, do this again and again. Uh, and uh, if you do it uh, ad infinitum, then uh, you get that u is an ascetic word. So u is, is uh, produced by an infinite sequence of uh, substitutions. Uh, now, uh, I already mentioned that uh, these substitutions are related to, to matrices. And if you look at uh, what we did before, so we wrote u in this way. And now, uh, if you look just at the indices, I1, I2, and so on, and we block them. So this is, the one is written A1 times, two is written A2 times, and one is written A3 times. Then we can regard uh, these uh, exponents here as uh, partial quotients of uh, a continued fraction algorithm, and we can define uh, a number alpha by uh, this uh, continued fraction expansion. And the, the, the nice thing is now, and this is uh, something I don't want to present here. So uh, now you uh, use induction, uh, uh, and uh, then you see that uh, the natural coding of uh, the rotation by this alpha on the interval minus one alpha he leads to the same as adic word. Uh, of uh, the same aesthetic word u. So uh, this means that uh, your Sturman sequence uh, can be produced by uh, this rotation. So uh, this is not so hard, So, um, uh, but uh, it's, it's probably a bit lengthy to explain. So if you, if you induce cleverly uh, your rotation on small intervals, then uh, you will find the continuous fraction algorithm and you will see. Uh, that uh, this induction process, each, each time you induce, you do another step in the, uh, uh, in the algorithm and you, you, you uh, add another substitution. So uh, what do we want to do? So uh, uh, there is something which is called uh, Rossi's program. So uh, to put it very easy, Rossi's program says generalize this. So what does this mean? Uh, so far, 
we just had uh, sequences over the alphabet uh, one, two. So we want to play our game uh, on sequences uh, of D letters. Uh, we want to uh, get some generalized continued fraction algorithms into the game. And we want to study uh, rotations uh, on the V minus one dimensional torus. Remember, we had two letters in the classical case, and the torus was one dimensional, so there's a dimension, dimension drop by one. Uh, so we want to study natural codings of toral translations with respect to bounded remainder sets. And uh, if you remember, there was an interval uh, uh, on which we projected the broken line. And uh, already there, I call this interval a Rossi fractal. Uh, the reason is that uh, in the high dimensional uh, generalizations, uh, this uh, interval uh, is uh, replaced by uh, some, some fractal structure. So, uh, what do we want to do? We want to, to code uh, or, or to find good codings of toral translations by means of aesthetic sequences that come from generalized continued fraction algorithms. And uh, so the bounded remainder sets that we can define uh, 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 Rossi fractals. This is what we what we want to do. And uh, before I give you an account of uh, general theory, uh, I want to do an intermediate step. So it was uh, conjectured since the beginning of the 90s, uh, as far as I know, that uh, uh, this program can be carried out. Uh, and uh, the first step was done in 1991 by Anu and Rossi. So they defined what is now called an anu rossi sequence. What they wanted to do, uh, what they did is uh, to uh, uh, find the natural generalization of uh, this Sturman framework to three letters. And uh, so an anu rossi sequence is a sequence on three letters, uh, which is uh, recurrent. So each uh, pattern occurs infinitely often. Uh, has low complexity, complexity 2n plus 1, and has only one right and one special factor of each length n. So there is only one word uh, which can be prolonged in um, two different ways to the left and to the right side. But uh, probably this is uh, not one, something I, I want to dwell upon. What is important for us, like for Stumian words, also for Anuro C words, you can uh, create them uh, in this asadic way. And if you look at the substitutions here, so the substitutions we had before were just those two substitutions. So now it is, uh, what, what, what we did in two letters is very naturally uh, extended to three letters by these uh, anu Rossi sequences. So this is the starting point, anu Rossi sequences, defined in 1991 by anu and Rossi. Uh, so uh, uh, anu C sequences, they are defined as asadic sequences, so by sequences of substitutions. And now you can uh, forget the combinatorics and just look into the incidence matrices of these uh, substitutions. Then you produce sequences of matrices, and uh, this can be uh, related to a continued fraction algorithm, which is now called the anu Rossi algorithm. Uh, this algorithm is defined in the following way. So you take uh, two uh, real numbers between zero and one, alpha greater than beta. And uh, so you look uh, in the projective space, uh, one alpha beta uh, is mapped to one minus alpha minus beta, alpha and beta. And so you uh, see very quickly, if you uh, choose an arbitrary pair of numbers alpha beta, then uh, this quantity will not uh, remain positive. And uh, so, so uh, then we, we, we are not uh, inside uh, our domain anymore and the algorithm stops. So this algorithm doesn't work for arbitrary pairs. Uh, in fact, it only works uh, on a set uh, of pairs uh, of measure zero. This set is called the Rossi gasket. It has this uh, nice structure here. Uh, this uh, picture is taken from Anu and Stausta, who uh, studied this set. So we have a continued fraction algorithm, a generalized continued fraction algorithm, which is defined on a set of measure zero. This is associated with uh, Anu Rossi sequences. With the, uh, this is the Anu Rossi algorithm. So now, uh, 
we can say so uh, the Anuro C substitutions are so to say the substitution selections of the Anuro C algorithm. Like we selected two substitutions for the classical continued fraction algorithm, we now select three substitutions uh, for the Anuro C algorithm. Uh, and uh, yes, the, the, the pairs uh, alpha beta associated with the frequencies of letters in the annual sequences that we uh, create by uh, a given. Uh, so each each pair creates uh, an infinite uh, string or product of matrices. So each pair creates an infinite uh, uh, string of substitutions. Each pair creates uh, the associated word and the frequencies of letters in these words they are associated with alpha and beta. So now, uh, what uh, Anu and OC proved uh, is that uh, each Anu OC sequence is the coding of an exchange of six intervals on the circle. Uh, but uh, so what we want is we don't want to, to stay in the circle, we want to go up to the D minus one dimensional torus, which would be the two dimensional torus here. And uh, the first uh, uh, result, uh, well, the first fairly general result in this direction is uh, if U is generated by a periodic sequence of C substitutions, then uh, this uh, word U is a coding of a translation by alpha beta uh, on the two-dimensional torus. Uh, this is due to Perti. Uh, Scholewey and uh, Zia Schell in 2012, and uh, also Masi Bach and uh, his co authors, they have uh, a similar result of this type. So, we have a periodic sequence, so this corresponds to periodic continued fraction expansion. So, this is uh, still uh, fairly special uh, if you uh, compare it uh, with uh, the case of arbitrary uh, strings. And the uh, conjecture of uh, OCE uh, was that each Anu OCE sequence is a natural coding of a translation by alpha beta on the torus uh, T2. So the hope was that uh, we can uh, generalize uh, the situation uh, in the classical case, one dimension higher well. So unfortunately, uh, things are not so easy. So there is a very nice paper by Cassegne, Ferenczi, and Zamboni uh, from the year 2000. And they proved that uh, the conjecture of Rossi uh, cannot be true in general. So uh, there is an annual C sequence that is not a natural coding uh, of a translation by alpha beta on, on T2. And the essential part of their proof is they were able to give a tricky combinatorial construction of a sequence, uh, of an Anuro C sequence, uh, constructed by these nice substitutions, but still uh, very contrary to the Stumian sequences that are all very nicely close to some slope. Uh, this sequence is not uniformly balanced. And uh, so geometrically, this means if you create a broken line in RD used by the sequence, then uh, this uh, broken line will move arbitrarily far away from any given uh, line. So uh, something goes wrong here, and uh, this information can then <clears throat> be used by uh, applying a, a result of uh, Rossi again to show that uh, uh, we cannot expect uh, the result to be true uh, in higher dimensions. So, and now uh, I start to report on uh, what uh, Valerie Berthe, Wolfgang Stein, and myself did. So we tried to rescue uh, as much as possible of uh, Rosie's program. So I told you that the uh, construction by Cassini and uh, his co authors, this is a very tricky, uh, clever combinatorial construction. And one hopes that this is not uh, uh, what happens generically. And uh, this is exactly what uh, we are proving here. Uh, we prove that uh, generically everything is good still uh, in the Anuro C case. So uh, if you take the Anuro C substitutions uh, and you create uh, some sequence using these uh, three substitutions, and then you define an esadic word in this way, then uh, for almost all sequences, this is important, uh, this word is uh, a natural coding uh, of uh, a rotation 
on T2, almost all sequences with respect to some uh, suitably chosen measure on, uh, on this space. The ingredients of the proof. Uh, so the first thing is uh, we need our continued fraction algorithm to be a good continued fraction algorithm. So we, we need that this Anuro C sequence is, is, uh, uh, has good convergence properties, even more than strong convergence, some kind of uh, uh, hyperbolic convergence. And uh, this can be expressed uh, in terms of uh, the second Lyapunov exponent. We need that the second Lyapunov exponent of the Anuro C algorithm uh, is uh, less than zero. This is a result that was uh, proved by Avila and Delacroix in 2015. Uh, at that time, so uh, in the meantime, our theory uh, is developed further. Uh, at that time, in order to prove such results, we needed some uh, combinatorial uh, arguments, some combinatorial study. Uh, uh, I read here a kind of finiteness property. Uh, I don't want to go into this, uh, but uh, we used uh, a result by uh, Berthe, Cholivier, and Zierschel from 2012. And uh, finally, uh, we uh, developed a theory of uh, S-adic uh, Rossi fractals. So the Rossi fractals uh, studied uh, so far, they were just uh, related to one single substitution, and we had to extend uh, these were C fractals to sequences uh, of substitutions. Uh, since these uh, new C fractals, uh, they have no uh, self similarity or self affinity property because the substitutions change at each step. Uh, they are far more general and it uh, takes uh, quite a bit of work to tame them in a, tame, tame them in a way that uh, they can be uh, used here. Uh, so. Uh, I'm always talking about the fractals. I just want to give you a, a brief idea on how they are defined. I already gave you a brief idea, but uh, in the first example, the Rossi fractal was just uh, uh, an interval, which is a bit uh, boring for a fractal set, of course. So uh, you look at this broken line. So uh, this is one, two, three, the three coordinate directions in R3. Take a nice Anuro C word, nice meaning that it has balance properties. Uh, we could come up with a lot of examples for those. Uh, then uh, create a broken line. Uh, uh, if the balance properties are nice, this broken line is at finite distance of uh, uh, a vector, a positive vector u, whose uh, entries are just the frequencies of the uh, letters. And then again, uh, you project the uh, vertices of this line onto some uh, hyperplane. Take the one have a particular to you, uh, just just some hyperplane uh, that doesn't contain you, and uh, then uh, you will get the set here. And uh, if you take the closure of this set, uh, this is what we call the uh, Rossi fractal. Uh, you see, there are three colors here, three uh, grayscales, uh, depending on uh, in which direction the line I took uh, pointed. I use a different color for my point. And uh, as uh, the, the interval uh, subdivided into two pieces, uh, admitted bounded remainder sets uh, for uh, rotations in the one dimensional torus, uh, the pieces of this Rossi fractal, they admit bounded remainder sets uh, in the general case. So far, we did the Anuro C uh, continuous fraction algorithm. Uh, please remind that this algorithm is defined only on a set of measure zero. So uh, this algorithm gives you uh, codings of rotations of the two torus, but only uh, for uh, a, a set of measure zero of possible rotations. We have to uh, work on this. Uh, we will see later in this lecture that we can improve on this and we can give uh, Codings for almost all rotations on the two torus and even on the three torus by using other continued fraction algorithms. So here is an example of a uh, Rossi fractal, of an s adic Rossi fractal. Uh, like a self uh, affine set, this Rossi fractal has a nat natural subdivision. However, if you look at the pieces of the subdivisions, they look different than the large pieces. So there is no uh, self uh, uh, affinity present here. So these s adic Rossi fractals they reflect the s adic structure, the subdivision structure is governed by these s adic sequences. Uh, the s adic Rossi fractals uh, uh, yield uh, uh, partitions, and uh, as I said, these uh, partitions give rise to natural codings for 
uh, rotations in our case uh, determined by the Anulo C uh, algorithm, and also these S Anulo C fragments are bounded uh, remainder sets. So uh, this is the first uh, non-trivial example, the first uh, application of a theory we set up, and then now uh, come to uh, review briefly the general theory that uh, we uh, developed in order to get results of this kind. And later I will uh, show you some applications of this theory. I will uh, apply it to uh, the uh, same algorithm, Cassandra same algorithm, and I don't know what, uh, what else is in my examples. We will see later. Uh, so we, we can do it for Jacobi Peron as well, and uh, we also did it for, for Brun in order to uh, play this game for uh, rotations on the three-dimensional torus. Uh, but first, let me uh, show you some elements of the general theory here. Uh, we first uh, need uh, multi-dimensional continuous fraction algorithms. Uh, this definition here uh, is inspired by uh, uh, papers uh, of uh, Jeffrey Lagarias uh, from the 1990s. Uh, so what is a continuous fraction algorithm? And sloppily speaking, a continued fraction algorithm is some gadget that produces matrices. So uh, we take uh, this uh, simplex here in the positive cone, and what we do is, uh, so to each element of the simplex, we attach a d by d matrix. And the continued fraction algorithm does the following. So uh, if, if, if we give it x, it uh, multiplies x by a matrix, and this matrix uh, is determined uh, by x. So for instance, if you look at the Ferry algorithm, you just have two choices. If the first coordinate is larger or smaller than the second one uh, in your uh, x, uh, you use the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1, or, zero, uh, or 1, 0, 1, 1. And, uh, this is just uh, the same game uh, played in more generality. So these are multi-dimensional continued fraction algorithms. And uh, what is very important for us is uh, good convergence, uh, generically at least. Uh, no, generically, this is what we need. So uh, we set, uh, if you look at these matrices that we produce, so you see I, I put a transpose and an inverse here. This looks a bit uh, strange. The reason is that uh, uh, I want to define a co-cycle. Uh, and uh, here I don't want to have any transposes or inverses. I define a n of x uh, by the product of the matrices that are produced by the continued fraction algorithms. Uh, and uh, this is a linear co-cycle because it satisfies this so-called co-cycle property. And uh, in order to uh, say something about uh, convergence uh, of continued fraction algorithms, uh, we uh, use uh, Lyapunov exponents. So uh, we take a d-dimensional continued fraction algorithm. Uh, we let A be uh, the co-cycle, so this has to be log integrable, so things must not get too large. Uh, this is very often easy. If you have additive algorithms, you have only finitely many matrices here, and uh, this is just uh, true for free. Uh, then you define the Japon of exponents uh, associated with this uh, co-cycle, and uh, the PSO condition says uh, that the second Japon of exponent is uh, less than zero. Yes, I should say that all our algorithms are unimodular. Uh, we are always assume that our algorithms produce uh, uni unimodular uh, matrices. And so why do we call this PSO condition? So uh, this is, uh, uh, so, so uh, these are exponents. So we, if you, if you, uh, uh, Take the exponential, then you see that one Lyapunov exponent is greater than one, and all the other Lyapunov exponents, uh, so they are ordered according to their size. All the other Lyapunov exponents are less than one. This is reminiscent of uh, uh, the notion of a Pisot number, and uh, it generalizes this notion of Pisot number uh, in the right way for our setting. So if the second Lyapunov exponent is uh, less than zero, uh, this implies that uh, the continued fraction algorithm is uh, strongly convergent. This is what we need. And uh, among all the conditions we uh, impose uh, in our theorems, this is the crucial one. This is the one that uh, is the most hardest to be checked. And this is also the reason why we cannot apply our theorem to arbitrary uh, 
torus rotations of arbitrary dimensions, we have to restrict ourselves for the moment in our examples to dimension two and three. Just a new C algorithm goes up to arbitrary dimension, but with the drawback that we only have uh, measure zero sets of rotations covered. Japanese exponents associated with continued fraction algorithms. So now uh, we want to generalize Sturmian sequences, uh, Sturmian dynamical systems. So let uh, a sequence of substitutions uh, over alphabet be given. Then the language, so just the language associated with the sequence is just a set of all words that are factors of uh, the first n substitutions applied to some data i where n is arbitrary. This is the language. Uh, and uh, so here I, I just uh, give you a short uh, hand of uh, products of substitutions. Uh, then uh, we define a set, a set of infinite words uh, by this uh, language property. So uh, X sigma uh, is the set of all words of the alphabet A uh, for which each factor omega is contained in the language. Okay. And uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, I can, uh, so this, this, this set is shift invariant, so I can uh, define the shift on, on this set, and this is a, a substitutive dynamic systems. The shift will often be uh, denoted by capital sigma. So this is something very easy. It's just a lot of notation. But uh, what I do here is I take a continued fraction algorithm. This continued fraction algorithm produces a sequence of matrices. And I don't want matrices, I want substitutions. So with, with each uh, point uh, in the domain of my continued fraction algorithm, I associate uh, a matrix. This does the uh, continued fraction algorithm, but I want to associate a substitution with it. This substitution is called phi of delta. And uh, uh, if uh, some uh, conditions are satisfied, then uh, you can get that this uh, diagram here uh, commutes. So you see the continued fraction algorithm on your shift. So capital sigma, as I said, is the shift on your shift uh, of substitution. So, uh, Phi of delta. Uh, this is uh, this is a set of of uh, directive sequences on which we symbolically uh, do our continued fraction algorithm. So now, so my time is is uh, running. Uh, here is what the peaceful point is. So. Uh, Take a continued fraction algorithm. We say that uh, point X in a delta is a periodic Pissot point if the continued fraction algorithm is periodic and if the matrix that is uh, produced within one period is a matrix whose characteristic polynomial is the minimal polynomial of a Pissot number. I just call this a Pissot matrix. And uh, so the same a periodic sequence of substitutions is called a periodic Pissot sequence if. Uh, this substitution here is a PSO substitution. This is a substitution whose uh, incidence matrix is a PSO matrix. Uh, so now I, I need to tell you something about uh, these periodic sequences. They are very easy in uh, a certain sense. So uh, let X be such a periodic point, a PSO point. Uh, then uh, the associated sequence of substitutions is a periodic sequence. And if you block this sequence, you get a single substitution. So what you do in this sequence is you just repeat the same substitution again and again. And then the, the dynamical system defined by this language is just a very well-known substitutive dynamical system. For substitutive dynamical systems, so they are well studied, but still uh, not everything is, uh, is clear there. There are uh, still open problems. And uh, the, the biggest one probably is the Pissot conjecture, which states that the substitutive system is measure, theoretic, measure theoretically conjugate to a translation uh, on a D minus one dimensional torus. D is the number of letters. There is recent progress by Marcy Barge, but this is still open. What is easy, and this is very important for us, it is easy to check for one single substitutive system uh, if it is measure theoretically conjugate to a translation or not. This is very important for the current result, for the, the next result I give you. So uh, this result says the following. So if uh, we have a continued fraction algorithm, which satisfies the PSO condition, 
so let phi be a substitutive realization of this algorithm. This means we just uh, don't uh, produce matrices but substitutions. And assume that there is a single piso point uh, in delta such that the uh, dynamical system x uh, created by phi of x has pure discrete spectrum. So we need this pure discrete spectrum property for a single point. And as I told you, there are algorithms to check this for a single point. So this condition is, is no problem. Uh, as I told you, the, the main thing is uh, to get the piecewise condition for uh, the algorithm. This is something that we can do in general. Uh, and uh, the result is then, so we have, a, we have pure discrete spectrum for a single sequence. And this entails that for new almost all x, in uh, the simplest delta, the s adic dynamical system x, phi of x, uh, sigma, is a natural coding of the minimal translation. Uh, this is a natural projection here, pi of x on the d minus one dimensional uh, torus with respect to a partition uh, of a bounded fundamental domain. This is given by the OC fractal. And also, this dynamical system is measured theoretically isomorphic to a translation of the D minus one dimensional torus. So uh, if I just can check something on one point, I get a result for new almost all points. So again, for, for new almost all points on the torus, uh, I get the natural coding uh, with respect to a partition uh, uh, of a bounded uh, fundamental domain with uh, Rossi fractals, and these Rossi fractals are bounded remainder sets uh, for this rotation. So uh, essentially, this means uh, if one point is good, then uh, this uh, Sturmian uh, world uh, uh, can be carried over to this continued fraction algorithm uh, in question. So we can even do this uh, when we accelerate a little bit, then uh, we even don't know a single point uh, which has pure discrete spectrum. But I think my time is expiring. I have to. Uh, uh, skip this once again the same slide. So the most important guy here is the OC fractal. Uh, it reflects the SRD structure. Uh, it uh, yields partitions that give rise to natural codings of rotations. Uh, and uh, uh, these OC fractals are bounded remainder sets. And let me quickly conclude with an example. So we can apply this to many well known uh, continuous fraction algorithms to Cassandra Selma, Nurosi, Jacobi, Perron, and Brun. And uh, let me just show you uh, Cassandra Selma. So this is a version of the Selma algorithm that was devised recently by Julian Cassandra. Uh, it is defined on this uh, three simplex here by two matrices. Depending on whether x1 is greater, equal, or less than x3, you multiply by one of those uh, two matrices. Here is the continued fraction algorithm. Okay. Uh, so this continued fraction algorithm is well known. The invariant measure is well known. We can associate substitutions with uh, this continued fraction algorithm. Uh, just, just to each matrix, we, we associate a substitution. And then, uh, so each point in the domain produces a sequence of substitutions. And uh, in this case, uh, it is quite easy to see that uh, the continued fraction algorithm uh, is conjugate to uh, the shift on this uh, uh, shift of directed sequences here, the directed sequences here, we just pull back the measure. Uh, it is known by Schweiger and Nakaishi that uh, this algorithm satisfies the piso con condition. So this is uh, this has good convergence properties. So this has second Japan of exponent uh, less than zero. So everything is nice. And uh, the only thing that remains to be done is we have to check that one single point satisfies the uh, pure discrete spectrum property. This can be done in an easy way. There are tons of algorithms uh, that can achieve this. Uh, you can, for instance, use the balanced pair algorithm to see that uh, the periodic point corresponding to uh, this period here, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 1, gamma 2, and so on, uh, gives you purely discrete spectrum. And uh, let me give you the result for this algorithm. Uh, this is um, due to Bertie Steiner and myself uh, in this year. And uh, 
to the fog and mu uh, again in this year. So what do we have here? Uh, let delta T a uh, new be the uh, Cassini decimal algorithm. Uh, then uh, this algorithm can be viewed uh, on this uh, symbolic uh, space of sequences of substitutions. And for this algorithm, uh, uh, for almost all x in delta, in the simplex, the following uh, things hold. The SID dynamical system is conjugate to a torus rotation and has purely discrete spectrum. And the shift, the symbolic shift, is a natural coding of this rotation with respect to a partition that is done by asadic Rossi fractals. And here is a corollary, which I think is nice. Uh, this corollary says that for almost all uh, T in the torus, there exists a minimal subshift x over three letters with a very low factor complexity, 2n plus 1. Uh, and the language is balanced on factors such that uh, x sigma is a natural coding of this rotation. So this is uh, for the two-dimensional torus. We can do the same for the three-dimensional torus using the Brun algorithm or uh, uh, using the three-dimensional same algorithm. Uh, in principle, the theory is suited also for higher dimensions. Uh, however, what you need to do is you need to uh, make sure that the piecewise condition holds, and this is something uh, which seems to be hard. So we look at this a little bit, but uh, this uh, this seems to be quite hard. So uh, I hope I am in time. Uh, Robert, thank you very much. Uh, this is what I wanted to tell you. Yeah. So thank you very much for your talk. Uh, you have one minute over time, so we have the possibility for some short questions. So if there are some short questions in the audience, please. You can use the public chat or just speak. To indicate that you want to speak. Of course, we also have the possibility to discuss problems that uh, arise today or tomorrow, in the tomorrow problem session, discussion session. Oh, there is some type by Clemens, some typing by Clemens Müller. At the very, uh, yeah, can you read that? At the, very chat. At the very beginning, you, you chose substitutions with given incidence mat matrices. Are there any other restrictions? Essentially, there are no other restrictions. Uh, the only thing is that you need to make sure that uh, this periodic point exists, which has purely discrete spectrum, but uh, this is uh, known uh, to be an easy task. A further question arises. Clemens, are you happy with that? <laughs> Not in general, this I cannot ask. Yeah, he is happy with that answer. So. A further question is typed, so maybe we wait a little bit. Of course, we are... a little bit over time, so... I'm waiting on the type of Samuel Petit. Yeah, here is the question. Jörg, please read it. Are there always coincidences for substitutions associated to numeration? This question, I don't understand. Yeah, I too. I, it's a quite... So, uh, probably understand. Yeah, so, you understand? Uh, so, um, uh, if you... So this is probably related to the theorem I didn't really show you. Uh, can I go on? Oops, no. Wait, he is typing again. So if the answer is long, yeah, I mean for the various algorithms. So uh, for the for the for all algorithms we were studying, it was no problem to come up with a, a periodic uh, substitution uh, which has uh, the coincidences. So we we just need one single uh, block of substitutions that satisfies coincidence, even super coincidence, uh, and uh, 
I mean, it's, it's for, for example, it is easy to check, but there is even more. So uh, uh, probably you want us to guarantee that uh, such substitutions exist. We cannot guarantee this. However, we can guarantee this for accelerations. And this is what I wanted to show you. So if you take your continued fraction algorithm, uh, okay, then you can... So, a yeah. further question of, of if, you yeah. this if you can, if you can, uh, 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 if you take an arbitrary algorithm, then you can uh, get an acceleration of this algorithm. So there is some k, and if you look at the, at the accelerated algorithm, then uh, you can make sure that for some k you always have uh, this uh, coincident property. So you don't need to check anything; uh, it always works. I hope this is what what you asked. Okay, there. Yeah, this, uh, this is important by, by Julian Cassini. Yes. So, if you want to control complexity, then of course different substitutions make a difference. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, if you look at the, the uh, algorithm that was invented by Cassini, so uh, here uh, it is crucial that you take the right substitutions to get uh, to get the, the low complexity. But uh, for the uh, conclusion of the theorems, uh, it doesn't uh, matter which substitutions you take. But uh, indeed, for complexity, the combinatorics plays a big role, and uh, you need to uh, you need to uh, make sure that you choose good substitutions. Uh, yeah, which is important. Uh, this is what Valerie uh, indicates here. Uh, we don't have only balance on uh, on uh, letters. We also have balance on factors in our theory. I think this is. This is written, uh, at least in the example, uh, we get balance on factors in our result. So really, the, the whole Sturmian world, uh, uh, no, this is not the right one, the whole Sturmian world uh, is uh, uh, still good. And as Valerie indicates, we use uh, proper substitutions from this, and we use uh, results uh, from a paper by uh, Valerie Berté. Bernardes and uh, Fabien Durand, I think, and uh, probably somebody else. Valerie, if you could write the authors, I don't want to forget somebody. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are some uh, results on uh, proper substitutions. These are substitutions with some particular combinatorial properties uh, that uh, make it possible to uh, get not only balance on uh, letters, but balance on factors. So the whole uh, Sturmi and Schmier uh, goes through yeah. in the... Uh, uh, high dimensional cases. Yeah, yeah, here you can read the authors. No, the, the authors. Samuel Petit is one of them. So sorry, Samuel, that I forgot you. Yeah. 